Our bottle's a little rickety. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, speaks of love in action. And love, in fact, is an action word. It is not a noun, but in fact, rightly uh, expressed, is a verb. Love in action. I remember back a very long time ago, a blind date arranged. Cousin says to me, hey, um, my other cousin is here for the summer. Should we have a, a date? And I said, no. And he said, oh, she is really a doll. And I said, well, I still say no. And then he showed me her picture. And uh, I knew my cousin to be a liar, but I didn't know how severe his uh, problem. <laughs> so he said, why don't you just go on the date and see what happens? Well, as 17-year-old boys will do, a, a date with an attractive girl is an attractive proposition, isn't it? And so he said, if it happens to not work out and you don't want to go on the date and you see her, then you could simply say to her, <clears throat> I'm having an asthma attack. <laughs> I don't think I can actually go out. I'm so sorry. And under those conditions, I agreed to go. So I go to the door, and I said, my name is Lee. And in fact, she was stunning, better than the picture, absolutely stunning. And I said, and so I'm overjoyed. I'm like, I've got a blind date with the princess of the world. And uh, she said, <laughs> I don't think <laughs> So my, my cousin had gotten to her before he got to me. <laughs> so love is such a real and important part of our daily existence, isn't it? From about puberty, whenever we find ourselves alive, 12 years old or so, from there until forward, you say, how old do you have to be to stop caring about um, the opposite sex? I don't know. I don't know if there's anyone in here old enough to tell me what that age is. Love is not a feeling exactly, though, is it? Love is an action. And the scripture teaches us about love and action. It commends for us a doing, a reality of care, not a theoretical, a doing. Caring, sacrificing. There are four words in the Greek for love. The first word that I'll express to you is the word eros, and it's not found in the New Testament. It is, we get our word erotic from the word eros. It's not in the New Testament. I don't know why it's not in the New Testament, but it's not in the New Testament. Of course, there is um, storge, and that is familial love. It's the love you feel when your baby's born. How many of you remember when your baby was born? Most of you probably lived in a time when you could watch the birth of your child, and I, I did both of mine, and you saw the baby born. And I just remember when that baby was born, I thought, hmm, look at what I have done. <laughs> she had a pointed head. <laughs> that went away. How great the love of the father for his children. And from that moment, I was already a believer. I was already a Christian. But I knew deep inside my bones that the father loved me infinitely more than I loved that baby. And that is an amazing thing. Storge love is the love a father feels for his child. And then, of course, there's a there is phileo, brotherly love, like I love my brother. And um, 
I remember just before he passed away, he's younger than me, or would be, he is younger. I remember talking to him on Saturday before he passed away on Monday. I just remember love. I just remember that I loved him. I don't remember exactly what we said, all the details, but I knew he was near death, and I just remember that I loved him. Phileo, love. But the most perfect love, of course, is agape. Agape is selfless. Most of the love that we experience in the world is because of love. Agape is in spite of love. In spite of kind of love. The love that you have greater than for your children, greater than for your brothers, greater than any eroticism could possibly bring you. Agape is the love of God for his creation. Romans chapter 12, how amazing this chapter. After having said to us that we should be living sacrifices, verse 1, and in verse 2 it tells us how to be living sacrifices through the renewal of our minds. Our minds are adapted, changed, transitioned by the Spirit and through the Word. And then verse 3, it tells us that we're to have a practice of a measure of faith. The measure of our faith should be practiced. And the, me, the, the word measure is an unusual word. It is metron in Greek. And what of this word? Does our, our, our practice of love, is our practice of worship to God, is our ability to be a living sacrifice? How does this occur? How are we to practice it? being a living sacrifice in measure of our faith. I think we've mistakenly tra transitioned verse 3 from measure to some type of word like quantity. So if you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says we're to practice or to have a, uh, we're going to live out our faith in a measure this word metronome that we have, a metronome, is from the word metron. It means measure. It is not quantity. How do we practice this faith that is living sacrifice? How do we have our minds transformed and live our lives according to the grace that is given to us? We're to walk in measure of our faith, not in quantity of it, but in measure with it. So this Greek word for measure in verse 3 is the word we get our English word metronome from. How many of you took piano lessons as a kid? Come on now. How many of you were tortured by a device like this? <laughs> so here's how the device works. Thank you, Wesley. Oh, my goodness, here we go. Is this on? I tell you what, no matter what the page says, this is the truth. No matter what I feel, no matter how I want to interpret it, this is the truth. The timing is 4-4. Four, four. I can't dispute it, I cannot deny it, and I cannot play around it because that torturous device tells me what the measure is. This is the proper timing. Musician, sir, man, play to timing. The drummer's responsible, isn't he? Thank you, John, for playing today. Where are you, John? Thank you. You kept the measure of timing. The guitar must come along and the piano adds the melody and some bass sounds. And then the bass. No one denies the sound of the normal measure. Except for human beings. Human beings deny the measure of proper sound because we say to ourselves, we shall march to our own drummer. 
So verse 3 of chapter 1 tells, of chapter 12 tells us that we must indeed live out the Christian life in measure, not in quantity of faith, but in cadence of it. How does this practically work? Listen to me now. Verse 1, be a living sacrifice. Verse 2, how can we be a living sacrifice? By the changing of our mind through the Scriptures. That changes our minds and enables us to be a living sacrifice. Verse 3, how do we practically live it out in measure of the faith or the assignment given to us? What metronome are you marching to? You all march not to mine, but to that of the Creator God who made you unique. As unique as you are. Why don't you just live in that uniqueness? Some of your problem is you're trying to live like someone else. Why don't you live like God made you to be in the cadence? See, your cadence is different than mine. Live yours. This is what it means to be a living sacrifice. That God in His wisdom made you just like you are and placed you right where you are. How wonderful. This God in His creativity, His imagination to place you where he placed you. And so therefore, what a mistake it is to try to live somebody else's cadence. Live your own for the glory of God. Live your own, brethren, please. It is of essential nature for your joy and for the, and for the fulfillment of God's will in your life that you walk your journey. And then we come to verses 9 through 21, and it informs us how we ought to walk in that cadence. How we ought to walk in that cadence Cadence is walking in love as we walk in rhythm to the person God made us to be. So no matter who you are or what your uh, gifting might be or your Whoever you are, it is to be expressed in love. With that in mind, let's read verses uh, 9 through 21. You're going to see two things here that I'll pop up in a minute. My, my basic outline is love within the family. Point one, verses 9 through 13, verses 14 through 21, love for those who believe differently than you believe. Love for the family, your friends, your buddies, love for your enemies. So the Christian walking in step with the Spirit according to the special creative handiwork of God in his or her life is walking in love to their buddies and to their enemies. If we would take verses 9 through 21 to heart and practice it in the Christian church, we would have no more conflict in the church. We would have no more political conflict. We would have no more conflict at all if we esteemed others more highly than ourselves. There would be no more conflict in any way. And so the church is standing around arguing politics and we ought to be proclaiming grace. Verse 9, let love be genuine. What kind of love? The only kind. The only kind of love that is any love is genuine. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. So love is not some wishy-washy thing where we're just like, oh, whatever you think, whatever you want. No, no, no. We can still abhor evil and love. Love Genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Wow. Like, go the extra bit to be kind and loving. Don't do the minimum. Do the extra. Verse 11. 
Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Continue to the needs. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so as far as it depends upon you, live peacefully, peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Ladies and gentlemen, your marching orders. Ladies and gentlemen, your marching orders. Love those you love and love those that you don't love. For love, Jesus said, is the way the world will know that you are his disciples. Look at John chapter 13. I'll have it on the screen for you. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will what? Know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So love is not an option. And you don't get to pick and choose who you love. You have to love everyone. You say, I have to love uh, persons I don't like. Well, yes. (laughs) It's easy to love the ones you do like. And didn't Jesus say, if you have uh, hospitality, if you love those who love you back, then what difference is it between you and the world? We are to love all people. Did not Jesus love all people? Jesus loved all people. Jesus loved Judas. And at that last supper, when Jesus said, one of you shall betray me. And they said, and oh, by, by the way, when Jesus said, one of you shall betray me, didn't all the disciples say, who is it? Is it I? How, how off could you possibly be that you could not recognize a traitor in the ranks. What is wrong with the other disciples that they could not recognize the traitor in their ranks? You know what was wrong with them? They were overcome with love. They were overcome with love to such a degree they could not even see the traitor in their midst. They thought themselves potentially the traitor. They thought themselves potentially the traitor. That's a cool ringtone, actually. Quite, <laughs> actually, quite like it. We love you, Sandy. Ain't no problem. That's probably money calling. <laughs> she deserved it. Why were the disciples saying, we, who could this be that would betray Jesus? Is it me? How could they possibly think that way? Because they were filled with so much love, they couldn't imagine it would be one of them. When was the last time you loved someone so much that you couldn't even think that they would do something off? We're so quick to criticize. 
We're so quick to label someone and name them bad because they don't, because as far as you know, they don't vote the way you vote. These people were sitting right in the midst of a traitor and didn't believe it because they were overwhelmed with love. The love that Jesus had, had taught them and demonstrated for them. So let's not be quick to criticize or judge other persons whose path you haven't walked, whose shoes you haven't worn, whose burdens you haven't borne. They couldn't even believe it was Judas. Doesn't mean that it wasn't real. Judas really did betray the Lord Jesus. The problem was Judas. And the demonstration of love was everybody else. They're like, who's it? It's probably me. They thought it was more likely themselves than Judas. Because of love. I want to love like that from people I disagree with. So, as we just read, verses 9 through 13, clearly, we're to love our brothers. We're to love our sisters. We're to love Christians. And to take care of them in a special way. And I think that's right and good. And then from 15 to 21, love your enemies too. The people you don't like, people you disagree with. So there we are, 9 through 13, love your brothers. Let's take a little bit closer look at it. I'll let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Genuine love is sincere. It's not, uh, it's not fake. It's not in name only. It really is real love. Like love in action. Abhor what is evil. Love that hasn't a, uh, uh, an awareness of evil isn't really love. It's a weird thing in our society today. And I just said we ought to love people who disagree with us. And we should. Loving people who disagree with us doesn't mean that we don't say this is wrong. There's some stuff going on right now in the world that is just plain wrong. You want me to name them? I don't have enough time. I don't need to burden your ears with, with the redundancy of what is obvious. There's a lot wrong in the world. And so being loving genuinely doesn't mean that we don't hate evil. Isn't that how Jesus was? When they mistreated someone, when the woman was caught in adultery and they were going to stone her and Jesus writes in the sand and he says, uh, basically, which one of you is without sin? Right? No, no, no. We can hate evil and we can love genuinely because those two things are not exclusive but are required to be the proper expression of love is, is to hate evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. There's that phileo, like your brother. You ought to love each other that way. So verses 9 through 13 really is talking about how to treat each other in the church. Do you, and I... <laughs> It, it feels to me like the movement to stadium kinds of churches is, is off put. I think it's off. When you say stadium church, I mean a church where you go into a stadium and no one knows you and you don't know anyone and you're coming as a spectator. Well, why don't you just stay home and watch it on TV? Genuine affection, how can you love and be loved without close proximity? The church is for close proximity. It is not uh, just simply a creed. It is not a denomination. It's not just a religion we practice. The church is to be an affection, a brotherly affection. Like, here you are, brothers and sisters. That's what's supposed to happen. How on earth in a stadium church where you know no one and they don't know you can you possibly have brotherly affection for one another? Just, just, just my point of view. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 
outdo one another in showing honor. My goodness. Like, what would a church be like if every one of us were trying to outdo each other in showing kindness to, our, to each other and to the world? Jesus said, how is the world going to know that you're truly my disciples? Because of how you love one another. Let's become experts at brotherly affection, kindness, sympathy, concern, well-being, and care. And then the world will know that we are his disciples. Otherwise, what are we going to do? You know the problem with cultists? cultic Christianity in stadium churches where we've got superstar preachers wearing thousand dollar sneakers. The problem is that the members have agreed to become stadium participants instead of brotherly connected in a local assembly where they know and are known. These cult leaders could not function in this church. You wouldn't put up with it. Would you? You would not put up with it. And why would you not? Because you know better. Brotherly affection requires close proximity. So why do you separate yourself? You say, well, I'm awkward. Uh, I don't have any friends. Or I don't know how to make friends. Folks, the... This fall, we're going to go into our new small group season where there's small groups meeting all over everywhere. Different times, different days, different places. I want to encourage you to go ahead and take the step toward brotherly affection by being knowing and known. Being involved in a group where you're vulnerable. You say, hey, this is my problem. This is what my prayer is. This is my pain. This is my sickness. This is my sadness. And you're sharing your life with other people in group. Life is better together. I'm going to tell you what. Being together sometimes is difficult because we're different. We have different views, different ideas, different language, different cultures. I've learned that coming from the South. You people are strange people. <laughs> I don't, sometimes I don't really know how to work with you. But you accept me. You accept me pretty good, most of you. Pretty good. I'm trying my best. We're different, but we have to be vulnerable. We have to share our lives with each other. And that's what this text says, isn't it? Isn't that what it says? Love one another with brotherly affection. So verses 9 through 13, love for the members, love for the brethren, love for your brothers and sisters. Love for those who have the same feeling you do about Jesus. Love specially for them. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Don't be lazy. Be determined. Be active. Because that's the definition of love. Love is action. Love is not a feeling. Love is a doing. Verse 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Look at the last part of the verse there, please. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Oh, well, first of all, the word hospitality doesn't mean what you think it might mean. You think, well, um, hospitality means I'm going to let my friends and my buddies come over for dinner. Hospitality, the nature of the word is not that you invite your family and friends, it is that you show kindness to strangers. So don't think yourself hospitable if only you entertain your friends and family. Hospitality is not friends and family, it is the nature of care for struggling, hurting, sad, lonely, desperate souls. They're hurting people everywhere. Our church practices the Family Promise program where we invite families to come in and have a place that's safe to stay at night. We, uh, you folks bring meals to them and feed them and care for them. We're going to have that start up next, next week. David, is Biggie here? Next week, 
We're going to have family problems. I don't know if we need more help or not. Look in the, probably in the lobby. Somebody will be out there to tell you. Hospitality is not entertaining the people that you already love. Hospitality is caring for people who are destitute, desperate, sad, broken, lonely, and broken. Broke. The word, very word hospitality is not engaging friends. It is serving the broken. When was the last time that you did anything for someone who could not pay you back? Brethren, we are Christians. We are, not, we are not Americans with some Christian sauce on us. We are at the heart to love our enemies and love people that are lonely, broken, hurting. And if we don't do that, then we are not practicing the right way of love of Christian. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Um, this, this might sound very strange. Do you know what? Everyone who's conscientiously working and doing the best they can, the church should not let you be destitute. If you're a Christian. Now, you know what? We cannot pay the bills for everyone in the whole world. It doesn't work that way. But for Christians, according to the Scriptures... Contribute to the needs of the saints. There cannot be a need in this church that this church does not supply and us be in right standing with Almighty God. I foresee a time in the distant future when our budget is equal in giving to the poor to the cost of operation. Now you hear what that means. We have a benevolence. We have a budgeted benevolence. We take up offerings regularly for persons who are in trouble. They get sick. They're behind. They, get, they, they, get, they have a problem. They, 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 get in, they get in trouble. And it isn't from foolishness. It isn't from mismanagement. It's life. And they are dealing with life. And they've got no other recourse. This church has so often accepted contributions, giving Extra gifts from you. I've given, you've given. And the persons who are broken and, and sad and in a bad, terrible spot, we help them up. What if the basic practice of NBC was that our budget was to give out as much to the hurting as we spend for the church life? That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? How do we get there? Well, we have to... We still have to pay the lights. We have to operate. I need to eat. I'm just talking about a grander vision of things where it's, the Bible requires us to love the brothers and sisters. Someone's in trouble. We got to help them. And so many of you have been helping. I'm not saying it doesn't already happen. I'm saying I wish it could become the DNA of the whole congregation. Where when we come, we just give. We, we, we get paid, we're blessed, we're doing okay. We, we, we got some money and we're doing all right. We're just going to give and give and the church is going to distribute and distribute and distribute. What if all of us had this determination that there would be no brother or sister with a behind mortgage or a car about to be repossessed or not having food, or not being able to pay for their medical care? What if we as a congregation decided that we would personally be involved in verse 13? Contribute to the needs of the saints. That's up to us, isn't it? Isn't it up to us? Dina says to me, why do you mess with writing a check to contribute to the church? Because I like to. I like to write my check and put it in that box right over there. Couldn't I just do it online? Well, sure. Many of you do that. But I like to write it out and sign my name 
And then I fold that check in just a certain way. And I drop it in that box. And when I say, so Pastor, you're talking about money. No, no, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about being a living sacrifice and not valuing this present world, but valuing the world to come. Not valuing my own comfort every moment, but considering the needs of others more important than my own. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about normal Christian living. Anything other than this isn't normal. You say, well, I don't know. No one ever said this. The scriptures said it the whole time. Contribute to the needs of the saints. No reason for any saint to ever go destitute. To the best of our ability, can we prevent any saint from ever being destitute? People that are in our sphere of influence. I can't fix the world. I can't fix everybody. You can't fix everybody. Let's help somebody. What do you think you got extra for? To make you more comfortable? What do you have extra for? To make you more comfortable? You have extra to do the blessing so that the world would know that we love each other. And when the world knows that we love each other, then what? They will believe he is the son of God. Let's stop right here and I'll deal with love your enemies next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we desire to love you and love each other rightly. We're humans. We got all kinds of temptations. We got distractions. We got problems. Some of us don't have anything extra. And because of that, this sermon should not make anyone feel guilty. It should make all of us feel motivated to help and love each other the best we can with the resources that we have. You don't ask of us more than we have. You ask of us with what you have given us to be good stewards. Then some of us are here and maybe we're new. Uh, maybe we've never been here before. And the scripture just said that because Christians love each other, that they would know that you're the son of God. They would know and believe in you because we, we love each other. This church is, we're, we're, we're working on it. We're, we're trying. We're trying to love each other. Probably the whole atmosphere of this service is a service of love. Father, I pray if there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord of, of their life, that they would just say, okay, Jesus, I, I, I believe, Pastor. I, I believe the Scriptures. I believe, my, I believe my, my loved ones who tell me Jesus is the Son. I believe and I want to believe and I want to be a follower. I want to love my friends and I want to love my enemies just like Jesus did. So how do I do it? Jesus helped them. Help them to know how to pray. Father, by your spirit, open someone's heart to be born again today is my prayer. And for the rest of us, let's stop playing games. We're, we're a Christian in truth, in action. We love in truth and in action, not in name only, not in theory. We got to love by doing. Help us to know how to do and where and when and to what degree to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.